Praise God. We've been working through an exciting series. Anyhow, I think it's been exciting. And uh, we've been talking about joy. So we've been having a good time doing that. You know, a lady named Malpy Badcop said this. Be on the lookout for God's mercies each day. The more we look for them, the more of them that we will see. Better to lose count while naming your blessings than to lose your blessings counting your troubles. Isn't that great? There's an old hymn of the faith that says, count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God has done. It's a beautiful hymn. And it's an important thing to do. All right. Now, let's go on our outlines this morning as we get ready to try and wrap this up today. We have already established so many facts in this series, not the least of which is what's at the top of your outlines, that when we are walking in this world that is so anti-Christ in nature, so troubled, so plagued with difficulties and hassles and unforeseen things that come our way, that when we are up one day that we can be kind of punched in the stomach the next and, and we can be taken down by something like that in terms of depression or discouragement or being down on the canvas. Secondly, that it doesn't have to come in a singular event, but we can go get into discouragement. We can grow weary in the battle. Maybe prayer issues that we're standing for that, you know, we can't figure out for the life of us how they're ever going to get straightened out. Family issues or any other thing you can think about. And these things, if we're not offloading them before the Lord with regularity, these things can weigh on us tremendously and take us down. Did you ever have something on your mind, on your heart so heavily that it was just wearing you out? Anybody ever been there? Did you ever have a problem that you didn't know how you were going to sort it out or how it was going to get fixed, and it woke you up out of sleep. And when you woke up, that's the first thing on your mind, and that's all you can think about, and you lost an hour or two of sleep until you finally passed back out. That's what we're talking about. Things that are over a prolonged period of time, the enemy gets his talons into us, and he bleeds our joy out. And if our joy is our strength, that means that we're going to find our Christian walk grinding to a slow halt. We're going to see our, our passion for Jesus begin to ebb and waver. We're going to see our forward movement begin to slow down to a halt, as I said. And we're going to see our vision and our perspective on things all get messed up. And we're going to think that the best we could muster is sheer survival not forward movement. And I'll tell you what, that's a lie. The, feeling may, the feelings of that, those feelings may feel real, but biblically, that's a lie because God's grace will always be sufficient for our trouble. Always be. Now, what we are sensing at that moment is that we're worn out. And when we're worn out emotionally, when we're worn out mentally, you will also see physically some changes come to you. And they won't be good changes. Right? You're worn out. You will see your appetite start go by the wayside. You'll see your sleep patterns start to get disrupted. You'll see the peace, a good healthy peace of mind that causes us to be productive in life. When that gets disrupted, it has a ripple effect on the entirety of who we are. And all of this is the enemy's plan to wear out the saints of the Most High, to wear us down and wear us out, and he does that by bleeding our joy. Now, we might look at it, well, if it weren't for this issue, I'd be okay. If it weren't for that, be okay. But listen, he uses the issues, but he, what he really wants is to bleed our joy quietly. And sneakily, because he knows all too well that the joy of the Lord is our strength. He knows this. And so we've got to be careful and diligent to guard our heart as 
Solomon said in Proverbs 4, guard our heart with all diligence, guard our emotions, guard our internal life with all diligence because out of that place will come every other good thing. You know, the scriptures even say that when someone's spirit is strong, it will sustain them even through times of infirmity or sickness. What goes on in the inside is more important than what's going on on the outside and more powerful. That's why when the enemy wants to break us, he wants to use issues on the outside, but really what he wants to do is he wants to bleed us and break us on the inside. And so we got to be careful with this stuff. Why do you think Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, he said, I think it's in verse 13, that now there abide these three things, faith, hope, and love. You notice that he doesn't lump faith and hope together. They are separate forces. This faith is in your spirit, but hope is is in your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. And then, of course, love is how all those things are expressed through your physical body. So faith is in your spirit, but hope is in your mind. When someone, you know, one person put it this way, there are no hopeless situations, but hopeless people looking at them. So when we are hopeless, it's because we feel hopeless. We feel hopeless because our vision of the issue is huge and our vision of the solution is small. So we feel hopeless because our perspective is hopeless. Much like the 10 out of 12 spies that went to the land of Canaan in the time of Moses. Remember that? 10 guys come back with what? A negative report. Amazingly, 12 guys go, two guys saw something completely different. They all saw the factual things in terms of the fa in terms of Enemies living in the promised land that they had to displace. Yes, swords would have to be wielded. Battles would have to be waged. Because nothing in God comes easily, guys. No territory in the spirit is going to come easily. You want to progress in God, get ready to fight for it. Anything that has value is going to be, is going to be given up by the wicked one with a great contest and a great battle. And so the Lord said, yeah, the land is yours, but you're going to have to fight for it. So 10 guys look and they see the enemy. They see everything that could go wrong. They see the obstacles. And then they come back and say, we can't do it. You don't understand. Boy, that really gets me. But you don't understand. If I had a dollar for every time someone said that to me in counseling session. And I said, I don't have to understand. You're right. I don't understand because I've never lived through that particular lifestyle or dilemma or but I don't have to understand. He already understands. Yes. And so these guys came back and they said, you don't understand to the nation of Israel. We can't do it. And it's amazing how if you read in Numbers chapter 14, the first seven or eight verses, it basically says this, that the testimony of 10 guys shipwrecked the faith of 2 million Israelites. Negativity spreads like crazy, guys. That's why bad news headlines sell the most newspapers. For those of you who still bother with newspapers, I do. <laughs> I like something in my hand besides this little gadget. I don't like, I don't like it. <laughs> Even on a plane. I, try, I tried that whole Kindle thing. It just doesn't work for me. I wind up trying to turn the page on an electronic gadget. <laughs> I can't. I said, if I'm going to go through this motion anyhow and pull the cover off of it, let me just stick with that book. Just, just not right. I don't want to do this. I want to turn a page. So, Anyhow, this is where we're at, guys. This is a battle. And if you look at the world today, this world is a troubled place. Troubled place. And it blows my mind to even imagine that Scripture that we're not even at a place in Scripture that Jesus referred to as the beginning of sorrows or the beginning of global labor pains. And I mean, we haven't even reached that precipice yet. And look at the trouble. Why? It's the sinfulness of men watered by the wickedness of the devil. Incredible. So we've got to have our lives together and tight. Now, here we go. Let's go. 
to our points, I want to get to number four before we close this morning. Number one, when our joy leaks and it will, living in this world, Jesus said it in John 16, verse 33, in this world you will have tribulation. That means incredible extreme pressure being pulled through the neck of an hourglass. You will have tribulation. Now, what does tribulation do? It throws your world upside down. What you knew to be stable and secure, that is thrown upside down. What you knew to be going this way, he turns it that way, and life just kind of flips your boat and capsizes your life. And so Jesus said, but we can be of good cheer because if we stand and walk in his footsteps, he has already overcome the world. You notice that Jesus didn't say this, because I've already overcome the world, you won't have tribulation. No, he said it's inevitable. In this life, you're going to have tribulation because you're like the proverbial salmon. The world is going to hell in a handbasket and you're going upstream to heaven. Now, it's amazing how many politicians blabber on and on and on about all this rights and this person's right, this group's rights and their rights and 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 no one talks about the good of the country anymore. Remember JFK? Ask not what your country can do for you. I couldn't even imagine a politician making that same speech now. But that's the deception that has crept in through liberal policies. And that thinking that is so fundamentally unbiblical. And so all of this nonsense that has crept in, the enemy is using it to bankrupt our society spiritually and morally. Because if everyone has rights, that only leads us to one conclusion on that basis, that there are no absolute truths and values that's got a tr that trump that are preeminent over the individual rights. And that's where we're at. Because pretty soon, every group on planet Earth that live in the United States are going to have their own group of rights. And pretty soon, there'll be nothing left for the nation to stand on. Because you can't spin that many plates that are all putting second things first and survive for long. So we need a revival but in the meantime, guys, we are believers living by the principles of God's word. And the rest of our nation seemingly is saying, forget about this. There are no things as absolute truth. Believe what you want to believe, and we will pass legislation to that effect. Totally discarding the principles on which our government and nation were formed. So, so here's the new formula. Let's make sure that we do everything opposite that the country was founded on and expect better results. Hmm, that's called dumb with a college degree. Now, here we go. Number one, never underestimate the power of joy. Our victory is going to lie in certain mentalities that we've got to adopt and hold fiercely onto, right? Right? Transform, we're transformed by the renewing of our mind, and God's word is the renewing component. That means that the world is going to say this, but trust God's word as our reference source. If God says this, and our nations and politicians say that, believe God's word. His word will always prevail. He's not in a rush, but his word will always wear other people out and prevail. Here we go. Number one, if we're going to make it, never underestimate the power of the joy. Underestimate the power of joy. Second, remember the seasonal nature of life's journey. Everything has its season, and if you're in a bad time now, rejoice because it has a limited time span. Problems have a limited time span. Trust God. Find his grace one day at a time. For that day, don't give too much thought to tomorrow because that will wear you out. You can't borrow. It's not, you can't, can't be governmental here. You can't borrow against something you don't have. You can't keep printing money that have, does nothing to back it up. 
Tomorrow's grace will be sufficient for tomorrow's decisions, challenges, and problems. Stick with today and keep putting one foot in front of the other. And don't be denied to that extent. Number three, reframe your thinking. Here again, we're back to God's word. Reframe your thinking to fit a spiritual perspective on life. You either have a spiritual perspective on life or you're going to have a natural perspective on life. You're either going to be faith-based. You know, in one of those letters that Carlos and Madeline and Christian were reading, uh, somebody referenced in there uh, Romans 4.17, that we serve a God that gives life to the dead and calls those things, King James says, that be not as though they already were. He, he speaks to those things that don't exist as though they already did. That's the difference in a governing life philosophy. If it's founded in God's word, we see through the problem to the solution. If you have a natural frame of reference, you will be fear-driven and gripped with fear. You'll be a hostage to every news report instead of believing that God's word. You know what? People are under this delusion that Islam is going to overtake the world. Let me tell you, that's a delusion. That is not going to happen. What you don't hear in those same news broadcasts are two facts. Number one, that there are more Muslims coming to Jesus Christ than ever in the history of the world. Ironically, there are more Jewish people coming to Jesus Christ as their Messiah than ever in the history of the world. That Muslims are being literally visited by Jesus in dreams and visions, and the gospel is being preached to them by the Messiah himself. Now, do you really think that MSNBC is going to report that? Give me a break. So that's fact number one, is that there are more people coming to Jesus Christ than ever in the history of the world. And the great in harvesting hasn't even begun. The second fact is this. God's word already says that his word is forever settled in heaven, forever binding on earth. And before the return of Jesus Christ, there'll be an ingathering of souls to such an extent that this world will never have seen a harvest of souls like the one that's going to come in before Jesus comes back. And guess what he's going to do when he comes back? He's going to lay wicked people to the ground. It will be destroyed, annihilated, obliterated, sent to hell where it belongs, which includes a lot of these isms. A lot of these demonic belief systems that are anti-Christ and unbiblical. He's going to deal with it. He's going to take care of business. We don't have to worry about that. Let me, let me say this to you. If it's not even on your personal radar screen to share the gospel with one person in a free country like the United States, what are you doing worried about end time stuff? Lord, send revival. Imagine him saying, yeah, and what do you, what'd you do with it? You won't even share with your next door neighbor, your coworker, your person in the grocery store. What do you care about revival? Well, send it. No, if I send it, I won't send it your way. Because I don't want you to take a lost soul, bring him to Christ, and then lose him again for me. I want people discipled. After Christ, I want people grounded in my word. We are called to disciple all nations, not just to pass out a track. We got to get it together first. This is where it begins with us. We got to stay positioned for blessing. You got to stay positioned for usability. You got to stay positioned from a spiritual perspective. Number four, let's go to this. We'll close. Oh, we have five. This fifth one snuck in on me on the bottom. Amen. All right, anyhow. Let's go to number four. We'll close for today. 
If we're going to make it, we got to adopt these mentalities, but now we got to get to, <clears throat> excuse me, more of a practical element. Number four, seek to rework your daily routine. Here's why. If we are following this whole, uh, this whole theme of what I've been talking about, things happen to us along the way that we don't expect. Things come our way, the curveballs of life, challenges of life, et cetera, et cetera. We've already said that. So if we're going to stay positioned, we have to get a regimen to our life. We have to do things on a systematic basis to make sure that uh, our spirit is filled to where it should be. Does that, does that make sense to you? Sometimes what the enemy uses are the distractions of our life, and sometimes it's the overload of our schedule. And I'm not saying you should toss your schedule out, but if we are aware of things that we might be able to tighten up on, it will help us to continue forward spiritual growth. And the enemy won't have place to wear us out. Can you imagine if you're working 80 hours a week? How spiritual are you going to feel? Hello? I'll tell you how spiritual you'll feel. The spiritual extent that you feel as soon as you put your head in the pillow. You'll be offering snore offerings long before praise offerings. <laughs> Why? Because the enemy uses the physical weariness, right, to bleed our spiritual strength away because we don't have time to get our batteries recharged. Not to mention, if you're pu putting out that kind of steam, what good are you going to be in relationships or in marital relationships? Or what good, what emotional energy and, and affection and attention are you going to be able to give to your children? So, oh, please, you don't know the day that I've had. Oh, oh, oh. And, you know, especially if you have little kids, they're like, oh, daddy's home, mommy's home. Oh, oh. I remember feeling that way. And I had to really, really suck it up, dig deep in the Lord, and say, oh, God, I'm a parent now. Yes, I'm a parent now. It's no longer about me. Your entire life is about Christ and your kids now. <laughs> you don't believe it? Just have an infant. <laughs> this little... This little infant can't talk, can't walk. Man, when they want to sleep, you cherish that. But when they decide that's enough of that, <laughs> that'll be quite enough of that, it rocks your world. You, there's no negotiating. It's like a Democrat and a Republican. It's just not going to happen. They're going to eat when they say it's food time. It's food time in harvest. For them, it's food time. When they want to get changed, it's change me time. When they want to let you sleep, it's time for you to sleep. When they feel merciful. When they don't, you're not sleeping. Mm -mm. See what I mean? Now, this is, uh, this is from a little person. Yeah. Owns the atmosphere. Just absolutely dominates it. So, in light of these things in life, we got to stay as tight as we can in the places that we can. This way, our margin of error gets respected. For example, if you're a single mom this morning and you are raising children, I hate to put it to you this way, but your margin of error with what you can let your kids get away with and skate on is minimal. It's a quarter of what a nuclear family unit, not that they should, but that they can typically get away with. Why? Because without a father in that home, the kids are going to try and play. They're going to try and play the game. Kids are good at that. Even if there's two parents there, they want to play one against the other to get their way. 
So you got to smoke that out real quick. Not going to play mommy against daddy. You're not going to play. No, 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 no. If mommy says no, don't go to daddy and think you're going to play him. <laughs> now, on those rare occasions, there may be a reason for this or that, but it's not for the kids to dictate that because that'll just lead them to be a manipulator later on in life. <laughs> so we got to rework our daily routine. Let's just read the scripture here. This is what David said in Psalm 63. He said, oh God, you are my God. <clears throat> Early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. Look at all these power words and phrases that I've underscored for you. Early will I seek you. See, there's got to be a seeking at some point. Correct? My soul thirsts for you. Does that sound like a dry, dead Christian to you? No. And Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They're the ones that can expect to get filled. So there's, whenever there's a thirst and there's an act, action on that thirst, there'll be a reciprocal movement from the Lord. He said, my flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary. We have to look for him, guys, where he is. Now, the sanctuary, of course, if you're looking at it from a Jewish standpoint, it would be the temple. But listen, he dwells on the inside of us now. Right? The Holy Spirit dwells on the inside of us. We have him living on the inside of us. So we don't have to go to a place to seek him. But I'll tell you what, sometimes you have to shut out the other parts of the world to hear him. To sense him, to feel him. You gotta, you gotta clear the noise and the clutter out of life. Everywhere you look, there's noise and things pulling you to the left and the right, de demanding parts of your attention and your affection. Life is busy. And so, again, our margin of error is small, and we gotta respect our margins of error. He says, So I've looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. When you come into the church, do you praise him? Do you praise him along with the worship team? The worship team is not putting on a show for you. We'll leave that to Billy Joel or somebody you might go to see or Casting Crowns or whoever you want to see. But this is a team that's trying to pull down the power of God and lift your heart to meet him. To lift you out of worldly thinking, to lift you out of the hassles that maybe you came in with so that you lay those down at his feet and let your spirit be encouraged up in his presence. That's what the worship team is supposed to do, and that's what they do here. From day one, we have never, ever allowed talent up on the stage that didn't have a heart for God. And a lot of people have walked out the door over the years because of it. So we gave them taxi fare and sent them packing. We're not going to have carnality up here couched in physical talent that don't even have a heart for God. Are you kidding me? When we planted the church, it was just Debbie and I. Debbie was playing the guitar with four chords that she knew, and I was singing. That's it. But we said, we are going to have the anointing. We are going to have God's presence. The Lord will help us, and he will add people over the years. And Thankfully that he did. And he has, and he will continue to do that. But the number one thing we looked for was, this is, does this person have a heart for Jesus? Are they a worshiper? Do they worship? Or just do they worship their instrument? Do they worship their gift, or do they worship the giver? Like we saw this little cartoon in a leadership magazine, and it shows a lady out on the church platform, and you know, she's trying to get her self-positioned, and there's a spotlight on her, and she's getting her mic tested and everything. And somebody says backstage, two guys are talking. He said, this song doesn't, does this song, she liked this song? He said, no, it doesn't mean a thing to her, but it certainly provides a great showcase for her voice. And sadly, that is rampant in so many churches where even the whole worship team, everyone is paid on staff. Paid, 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 paid. Listen, you'll never be able to pay for faithfulness. You can't buy faithfulness. Look at the idiotic pro, pro sports teams we have. You can't even buy attitude. You can't buy the punk out of somebody. 
You just enable them to be punkier at a higher level in a better neighborhood. No. It's what's on the inside of all of us that God is after. He looks upon the heart, but he wants our heart. And some people have such bad attitudes, man, that you wonder why God won't bless you, and he won't bless your decisions because there's some very soulish decisions or maybe have just bad attitudes that he wants to rework out of you. David said, my lips shall praise you. I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. It's incredible. This is an Old Testament passage, guys. Old Testament, this is going on. And now in the New Testament, we have a new and better covenant. The king of glory dwells on the inside of us. The same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead now dwells on the inside of us and gives life to our mortal bodies. And we're in a stupor? When you got David going ballistic here? <laughs> well, we don't like the Old Testament. You better read the Old Testament. Buddy, you better read the Old Testament. This guy right here is slapping most Christians silly. This one passage. Bam, bam. We ought to examine ourselves in light of God's word. This is captured in scripture supernaturally by the king of glory, by the Holy Spirit, for our instruction. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul will be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. My mouth shall praise you with grumbling lips. Oops. Oh, it's not there. No, he says joyful lips. He said, when I remember you on my bed, now his day is over. You see where his day start? Early will I seek you. Look where his day ends. When I'm lying on my bed. Now, maybe you're lying on your bed and you can't go into a full praise meeting. Wake everybody up. Well, listen, that's when you want to Clear your brain out. Clear your spirit out. Let the last thing that graces your brain and your mind and your spirit be just giving thanks to him and getting that last kind of drop of anointing from him. Isn't that a great day to end your day? Amen. It'd be amazing how it can, you want to talk about hangovers, you'll have a good hangover the next morning. You won't need that Bloody Mary. Be straightened out, all straightened out, no. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you even in the night watches during the course of the night. Because you have been my help, therefore in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. David said, my soul follows hard after you and your right hand, the hand of God's power, upholds my life. Woo, what a beautiful passage of scripture. All right, let's stand please. Our time is shot. I'm so sorry.